Our next session uh, should be beginning uh, 30 seconds ago. Oh my, this train is off track. I would like to remind our speakers also that we do have balcony participation today. There are people seated in the balcony, so uh, if we will watch for questions, I will admit that there is a bright light shining directly from up there, so I have a very hard time seeing the people, so uh, don't forget that their participation. And now, all yours, Isabel. Okay, so our second session will be shared by Alan Spence, Director of Regulator Liaison, Liaison Network Rail, and he's also, we have the honor having him as a chair of the UIC Global Level Crossing Network. So please, Alan, and uh, Asim Saman, Elizabeth Vaynot, and Dr. Congress, could you please come on the, st on the stage? You have micros? Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Oof. I'll make it. I need that. Okay. These are a lot squishier than expected. So thank you very much to Isabel for introducing me. Uh, pleasure to moderate this session where We'll start to talk a bit more about technology and its capacity to help us manage risk at level crossings. Uh, this isn't about uh, looking at what we have done before, it's about looking about what we can do with the new. Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker. Um, uh, I'm told it's Beth, why not, um, who is uh, a yes, specialist in uh, human decision making. Uh, she's a cognitive psychologist uh, and is uh, an associate professor at uh, Michigan uh, Technology University. Um, there's uh, something very connected about our presentations over the two days here, uh, in that I noticed that um, Beth's uh, presentation covers two of um, the NTSB most wanted list items that we heard about yesterday from Thomas Chapman. Um, I don't mean to say that Beth is on the most wanted list, but she's definitely covering off the things that NTSB has set as its priorities. Uh, now, in terms of uh, moderating this session, uh, I am going to stick quite rigidly to 15-minute sessions for each of the speakers, uh, and the most important reason for doing that is uh, we are the people between you and your lunch. Um, the slides, thank you very much for this. I'm, this is my first time at ILCAD. Uh, I work with Posse Latula at Michigan Tech that many of you probably know. Um, so I think we're in a different order. Okay, you're good? Great. Um, so this is my first time, like I said, at uh, ILCAD, but I've had such a great time and learned so much from you. Um, and all the speakers yesterday. And in fact, um, I actually attended Gunn High School, so hearing that story yesterday um, from Dr. Perry was really interesting, because I had been wondering about the people at the crossings in that place, um, in the Bay Area. So the work that I'm gonna be talking about today is um, two projects, and so kind of where we are in these two projects. And so this is a collaborative effort uh, with technologists that design technology, uh, co computer scientists, engineering. Um, Dr. Lutu Lautala is the head of the rail transportation program at Michigan Tech. He's currently in Finland, or he would have been here himself, and he's um, sad that he's missing it. And then we have collaborators at Virginia Tech. So Dr. Philart Jean does sound design and driver research. And so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about two different projects that are currently ongoing. Um, but very much a collaborative effort with our talented grad students at both universities. Um, so several people have talked about this in the last session um, and over the past two days or the past day, but 
The number of um, rail crossing incidents has gone down in the last 30 years, but it has held more or less steady or plateaued, as some mentioned earlier today, um, with about 50% uh, happening at active warnings. And so part of the solution, we definitely agree, is a collaborative solution. So I am a decision researcher. I study how people make decisions in uh, naturalistic environments, so real people doing real work. I study um, in technology-mediated environments as well. But we often try to structure the environment to improve the decision making, we try to understand the strategies that people are using, and we try to run um, and we try to look at the integration of kind of what people are doing in these situations um, to improve it. So we will we will be talking about in vehicle alerts in this case. So this was also mentioned. Um, I first want to call your attention to the right hand slide. So this is FRA safety database. Um, and a table from the FRA. And um, one thing I want to point out is just that the number of accidents at active crossings is still about 50% of all incidents. Even with all the improvements um, and all the um, solutions, engineering solutions that have been implemented. The second thing I want to point out, so that's over on the right. So relative to passive crossings, there's still um, things happening at active crossings. The second is that driver behaviors have changed. Right, that, that their drivers are switching their strategies or changing their strategies. And so you can see in the middle, uh, at the passive warnings, there's a lot of people that just don't stop, right, um, relative to kind of the gate. And then, um, let's see if that, oh. And, but then there's a switch to people now going around the gates, as we've been hearing about, right? So a lot of um, important stories there. And so, and important examples there. So what we're trying to do is look at this um, kind of from a holistic situation. What we will be talking about today is some newer applications, so in-vehicle alerts and an infrastructure vehicle communication or an RCBW um, system that was developed by FRA and Battelle uh, that we have done a field study with. So these are two kind of newer applications to address this challenge. Um, so here are the two projects. Just briefly, so I will talk about um, a lab study and a simulator study, and then something that we don't often do, but a field study, so on surface roads in the UP. So the first study is this in-vehicle alert studies. This is a series of studies um, that have been ongoing for several years. This is in a phase two. This is an FRA-funded project. And um, these are three sound design studies. So in these studies, what people have done in the lab was they have people drive in a simulator, and um, then get familiar with the route, and then they give them sounds and have them rate the sounds. Okay, so Ian, if you could just play the three sounds. There's three sounds here that we're gonna play just to give you a sense of kind of what the in-vehicle alerts are. So that's the earcon. Slow down, rail crossing ahead. Look left and right at crossing. Great, and then the hybrid is a combination. that would have had the slow down afterwards. I'm not sure what's happening there. <laughs> a little partici uh, audience participation there. So these, there have been a series of studies. So Phil Art and his um, students have done, run a series of studies around different kind of components of the sound and the speech. Um, he actually came from industry and was designing, if you have an LG uh, 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 stove like I do, he might have designed your sound 15 years ago that's in there. Um, so these sounds were designed and the first day was this lab study. So this is one of kind of three or four studies that were done, but this is just to give you a snapshot. So this is ratings after they've done that familiarization. And so you can see over on the right that the annoyance level for the earcon, no surprise, it's more annoying than the speech or the hybrid of some sound with speech. Um, the appropriateness is different between, the, between them um, with the hybrid being more effective. For meaningfulness, the hybrid's uh, more effective. And for distraction, the earcon um, was rated as more distracting. So they took this lab study and then they moved into a simulator. And so in a larger simulator study with 35 participants, um, average age 22 years old, they were testing whether or not when they, per when they used the hybrid, which was deemed the most uh, effective in the previous study, when they, when they um, 
when they ran the scenario with the hybrid and got a hybrid warning versus no warning, these are the results. So on the top, you can see the first question that was asked was, does breaking behavior change? So on the right is, um, on the right at the top, I know it's hard, a little hard to see, is on the left side is without a sound warning or IVAA warning, and on the left is with the sound warning. And then, um, the, then you have active and passive there. And so what you can see is that there's a, a slope. So with, with the sound warning, the amount of breaking has increased. And, um, and then there's a difference between kind of active and passive warning with some greater breaking happening at passive warning than active warning. And then on the, on the bottom right, you can see that the looking behavior, the sound also changed people's looking behavior. So this is a likelihood to look both directions, left and right, at the rail crossing. Um, on, the, on the right is without the sound. So when they ran the simulator um, in the scenario without the sound and then with the sound warning. And so you can see it's also increasing the likelihood of looking behavior. So that's just a snapshot. Oh, and the other thing I was gonna mention about that project is that we're currently running a larger project as part of that program. So we're running um, a larger sample of participants in a more systematic controlled experiment um, with more variables that we're testing kind of validating. So Dr. Jian's been uh, validating all the ind variables individually over time in separate experiments, and now we're sort of putting it all together. It's being run at uh, Virginia Tech, at Michigan Tech, and at the Volpe Transportation Center. The other thing we're doing with that study um, is running older adults, so 65 and up for older adults and younger adults, and running a comparison with older adults and younger adults with these alerts in this study. And so this is, uh, the larger say is about 60 drivers in the um, younger uh, group, and then um, 40 drivers or so in the older group. So the second study I'm gonna talk about is one that was mentioned, has been talked about today um, in, this, in the previous session as well, is this notion of an advanced warning system device. Um, and this is, the rail, this is the rail crossing warning violation. This is a prototype open source system um, developed by the U.S. Department of Transportation, FRA, and uh, Battelle, and it leverages kind of the V2 um, card infrastructure technology. Um, it provides a visual and auditory warning for vehicles approaching the crossing. So you can see the warnings on the right. Um, so at the top is an active, uh, an active warning uh, that someone is potentially at an imminent violation warning. Um, the second one is that there is an activated crossing alert ahead. And then the third one is a, the, a vehicle that stopped on the track. So much what, like we saw in the demonstration there. So the idea is that this is, um, and, and these are, this is an algorithm that includes speed, location, risk of violation, uh, where people are in the approach zone and where they are in the crossing zone. And so what Michigan Tech was focusing on was um, there's been a lot of research in connected vehicles in the last few years, but no one has really, uh, the, the research is just beginning to look at connected vehicles with infrastructure. So talking to the trains or talking to the um, other cars potentially, or the system. And so that's what our, um, our task on this was to do a prototype um, put this in the field and do a prototype test as our first study. So this was an early, early evaluation of the system, of not of the system, of the sort of people's experience um, with it in the field. So let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, this, is, this is a 12-mile route in Escanaba, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where uh, we live. Uh, this is about three hours away from Michigan Tech. There are 12 rail crossings at this, in this loop, and um, we were running a study with drivers on, on surface roads. You know, I've been doing human factors research for more than 20 years. I rarely do studies like this, right? Human factors people usually are in simulators. Um, we're in the lab. We're rarely in the field, but I have done uh, quite a few field studies. So this was very unusual for us. Um, this is Dr. Latula in the, <laughs> has a demo here in the um, setup. So you can see that he's in the, he's as if he was a driver. This is a Chevy Volt connected vehicle. 
Um, the so you can see that we had video cameras. We had the we had the car instrument in the back with video cameras on the person so that we could look at their looking behavior and then behind the head um, so that we could see what they could see out in the road, which turned out to be quite helpful um, with kind of how this was working. The Chevy, we analyzed data from the Chevy um, CAN data, so the data that's coming out of the car, the um, GPS-based and time-based. Uh, the RCVW was in the center there that we have marked, and then there was an observer in the right. So this was really important that this was um, done incredibly safely. Uh, we were avoiding, there was actually a mill that's on this route that we avoided their shift changes and when there were a lot of people on the road. So we were running uh, two cars, one every hour or so. Uh, they were sort of staggered to run um, this 12 mile loop. And so it took about half an hour to run this loop. And so the two instrumented crossings are the first two that are pointed to um, in bl with the blue arrow. And then, so people drove it to get familiar with it. So just like we might do in a simulator where we have people drive in a simulator, they were driving on actual surface roads. They went through seven different crossings, two of which were um, instrumented, one of which was activated. Uh, and so this required a lot of setup. So we were there for four days, two days for the setup. Um, just to test the setup and CN, I was eating barbecue with CN uh, yesterday. They were very helpful in um, instrumental in getting this uh, working. So we had this set up at one of these crossings to communicate with the, with the RCVW in the car. Um, and so we would start, um, so two days was for just testing in Escanaba, last, the final test round in Escanaba, but then we had two days of data collection. So we collected data from about eight drivers each day. And um, so we would start set up at about 6.30 in the morning, then our first participant was at about 8.30 in the morning. Uh, and we would go through this very um, systematic screening that I didn't mention earlier. Uh, we screened people before they came to participate in the stage so that they were eligible to participate. They needed to be driving for several years, so we only, they had to have been driving for two years at least. They had to be accident free in the last two years, um, in the last six months and they had to not be taking sort of medication that might impair their driving or affect their driving. Second, we had an observer in the car. So the observer was there for navigation in case they were needed, but also for safety. Um, and then we interviewed them afterwards. So this is really a qualitative study looking at kind of how people, what people's experience were afterwards. And so the one thing that we did was a usability test, a very standard SUS usability. The system was highly usable, easy to learn. Um, we had given the system, we had given the interface to people uh, before they started the study. We gave it to them again once um, right before they did the drive. They felt it was easy to learn, easy to navigate, easy to respond to. We interviewed them afterwards. Um, about 11 of the 15 drivers remembered exactly what warnings they saw and they were accurately remembered. So this is an incidental memory test that we do in, in um, psychology and cognitive psychology. It showed that they had good attention. And um, 11 of the 15 drivers thought the timing of the warning was good, four thought it could be a little sooner, and they mentioned things, um, better uses, good uses of the system in terms of uh, distracted driving, in terms of driving in unusual environments like people have mentioned earlier today. And so I'm just gonna, um, this is really a collaborative effort, so I just wanna um, highlight that we're covering kind of new, uh, I, new V2 technologies to infrastructure. And it's been really a collaborative effort between uh, psychologists, technologists, railroad operational people, and been really fun. So thank you, and I want to acknowledge our funders for this. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, and now, my apology, because I shuffled my papers uh, and uh, completely uh, put uh, all, all the speakers off because I got people in the wrong order. Um, so uh, that, that's absolutely my fault. Uh, next up, we have Asim Zaman. Now, uh, Asim is a project engineer at Rutgers uh, University, the Center for Advanced Infrastructure and Transportation. Uh, he has a specific interest in using uh, artificial intelligence to uh, detect trespassing uh, on the railway. Um, a li little confession to me, every time I see the letters AI, it means something different to me being brought up in agriculture. So uh, I, I always try and spell it out completely as artificial intelligence. Asim, the floor's yours. Thank you so much, Alan. And thank you all for uh, inviting me here to speak today. 
I was told that in order to have the perfect speaking voice, uh, someone told me this, that you should hum happy birthday, uh, and then it puts it in the perfect way. So, I don't know if it worked or I'm just being tricked over and over again by the same person. But anyway, uh, let's get into this. So today I'm going to be presenting you some research on uh, where we used artificial intelligence to map what we call trespassing. And I think to get into that, I need to define that. But before we go there, I need to say some thank yous and also disclaimers, which is a little strange. Uh, so the first thing here is we want to thank the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, they supported us in this research, specifically uh, Francesco Bedini Giacobini, Dr. Sheila Blue, who's here today, and uh, Mike G, who have all been excellent administrators of the grants that supported this. Uh, we also thank the Volpe Center and all the folks that are there who have given us video data to help us uh, along in this research as well. I also talk like an auctioneer, so I need to slow that a little bit down. Anyway, uh, and the disclaimer part is all these views are our own, uh, none of the supporters here. So let's define trespassing here. So uh, the word is used uh, uh, differently in different contexts, but here's how I define it in this research. It's unauthorized per people or vehicles who are in an area of transit property not intended for public use or enter an active signalized grade crossing after it's been activated. So if I ever throw out the term trespassing here, this is what I mean. Some people might call it grade crossing violation. Some people might have other names for it in different countries. But this is essentially what I'm talking about. And here you can actually see what I want to tell you folks about today in action. So we have an artificial intelligence which uh, does the following. It looks uh, at the video frame and sees whether or not the crossing is active. The user is able to draw a green box there, which we call the region of interest. And then for every single frame, the artificial intelligence, or AI, I'll do that going forward, uh, looks to see if it can recognize a person, a vehicle, a truck, or some other kind of object inside of, that, uh, inside of the video frame and tracks it from frame to frame. And if all that comes together, then we got a trespassing event and we record that to a database. So there's a little bit of a timeline of how we developed this. Uh, in 2016, we started this with some university-funded research to see, are there a lot of these events that are occurring that don't result in fatalities directly, and can AI actually pick up this data? That led to some FRA-funded research uh, and some FTA-funded research where we're looking at all these different locations uh, at a, at a, for a long time. So this research that I'm going to tell you about today, this is one-fourth of the FRA project. Uh, we looked at one grade crossing, a quiet zone, from January 1st, 2021, for a year and a month uh, until January 31st, 2022. So that's 400 days. Uh, we had 96, uh, 9,600 hours of live AI analysis. So this is running every hour, every day during this time. And we have two plus terabytes of trespassing video data, lots of stuff uh, that we can actually mine for information, and uh, over 3,000 trespassing events at this location. In total across the project, we're upwards of 25,000 trespassing events. So this location wasn't the worst that we saw, but it still uh, has lots of interesting information. Every time a trespass occurs, we get the start and end time, we get the weather, uh, we also get the trespasser type, whether it's a person, car, truck, bus, bicycle, etc., and also the train occupation time, so as soon as the signal starts uh, to the point where the signal ends, and we also gather the traffic uh, based on the same kind of classification, people, cars, truck, bicycles, etc. So I mentioned the term quiet zone here. I think I need to go into the definition. Some folks mentioned it earlier, and I think we talked a little bit about it on bright line. So uh, according to the Code of Federal Regulations, locomotive horns have to be sounded, uh, but you can silence them by establishing a quiet zone. And local governments have to convene a diagnostic team and review a lot of different data uh, points in order to say, okay, what do we need to do to upgrade this crossing to make it safer so that we can have a quiet zone in the first place? Or they can be grandfathered in through uh, like legacy programs. So that's a summary of that. This quiet zone is located in Virginia, or Ashland, Virginia. And this is a pre-rule quiet zone, which is that grandfather thing that I was talking about. This is in the downtown. It runs right down Main Street of, this, uh, this, uh, of Ashland, Virginia. Uh, and uh, that kind of makes sense of why it would be a uh, quiet zone here. You don't want blaring horns, or the, the people don't want blaring horns in their, uh, their businesses. Uh, so this is what the crossing looks like, and an example of one of the violations we were able to pick up. Uh, this is, it's sad to say that this is somewhat typical. So you got the crossing activated, and then a person decides to go around the active signalized crossing gates uh, while the locomotive is bearing down on them, essentially. You know, they saw it coming, and I'm not sure what was going through their head, but this is one of those violations. So we look at these for the entire year. We're able to slice it temporally, categorically. We can really mine this data for a bunch of different, uh, in the pursuit of finding better ways to solve this problem. So here we have a temporal heat map where on the left you have the days of the week, and on the top there you have hours of the day, and you can see that there are certain hot spots uh, temporally. And this can inform enforcement solutions. If you know exactly which hour trespassing occurs the most, then you would be able to surgically place your uh, 
transit police officers there to ameliorate this issue, to keep people at those worst hours. This gives you that, uh, that surgical information. Another thing you can do is you could run this before you put in for, uh, an enforcement or engineering solution and map the changes afterwards. So you can get two different heat maps here, a before and after. And this can also be part of that whole evaluation of quiet zones, whether they should still be quiet zones or whether a place wants to be a quiet zone in the first place. We also have the categorical information. So the pie chart on the left there uh, talks about all the different classifications, mostly cars, then trucks, then people, very few buses and uh, bicycles, thank God. Uh, so for uh, another thing you can do with this is you can map it versus the traffic to see, is there any uh, disparate changes there? Are, there? are people way more likely, are the cars way more likely to trespass uh, than their counterparts? In this particular data set, it shows that people are more willing to trespass here than their relative proportion of all the traffic that occurs. And this can, again, inform different types of engineering solutions here. Do we need ped gates because they're way more willing to violate? This can support that. Uh, this is breakdown by weather, and, and uh, I've, I'm trying to see how weather could play into designing enforcement or education solutions. One idea that I had was that uh, if people are way more willing to trespass while it's raining or snowing, maybe installing a shelter that's set back from the crossing might, be, uh, might pool people there so that they're not rushing across to try and not get wet um, if they're willing to wait. Willing to wait. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this is another visualization here. It looks like there's a bunch of spaghetti or silly strings sprayed all over here, but for every time, every time a trespass is recorded, the center of the bounding box is uh, recorded and tracked for the entire frame. So you can start to see where people are coming from, where people are going to, and that's another depth and level of information here that can lead to more engineering solutions. Are people making that left-hand turn into the crossing with no gate? Um, are this data can inform that and, or can find out whether that's the problem and then decide, hey, we have a justification here for putting another gate or making this a quad gate location. <clears throat> and if you take those points, this graphic here shows the, uh, the first point of that trajectory, uh, essentially where they're coming from. And this is for uh, pedestrians here. And you can see that most of the pedestrians were coming from this, uh, this near side of the crossing. And that can inform this is where we need to put a pedestrian gate based on this data that we've collected. All right, uh, and the same thing goes for vehicles. There's a slight difference here. You can see on the left that there's a, a slight more bias towards people coming from that direction, and that could say, hey, we need to focus on this area versus others. I think this is one of the last graphics I have here, and this is essentially a breakdown of near-miss time, uh, which is essentially the time of train arrival to the time of trespass. So how close are people getting to the locomotives that are passing through here? And uh, what this can, this can start to tell you what kind of, uh, or how dangerous this crossing is. It seems that most people are around 25 seconds, that's how far they are from the locomotives, but there's some very concerning uh, trespasses that are happening uh, down by that few second mark. People that are just making it through like that example that I showed you folks before. And this depth of data, again, can inform these engineering enforcement and education solutions. Uh, I put this in here to, We've mentioned that they're trespassing in general. It happens on the right-of-way as well as grade crossings. And this was a, a upsetting example that we had picked up here, where you have folks that are taking graduation photos on the tracks. And while this system works on grade crossings, it has that whole thing, a simpler application is for folks in this scenario. And this informs, or could inform, an education solution. You could look at the nearby schools and show them this video and say, hey, don't trespass on the tracks. Don't let your graduation day be the day that you die, you know, or something along those lines. I'm not great at the taglines, but uh, there are much more talented people who can come up with things like that. But I can tell them who to talk to uh, with this AI. All right, so I think this is my concluding slide here. I went a bit quick. Uh, like I said, auctioneer. Uh, at the end here, you're, the benefits of this data can inform these solutions. From an engineering perspective, you can uh, formulate solutions based on this. Here's where we should put fencing. Here's how we should upgrade this crossing. Here are the gates that we should add. And it can support future uh, improvement grant applications. Hey, we gathered all this data, and this is why we're putting this solution in place. And then do a before and after. Did the dollars that I invested actually work? Did it make any kind of impact or change? Or how did it shove people to trespass in other ways to, to, continue, to, to continue to drive that down? The education example I told you about a moment ago, school outreach, but there's a lot more that comes out of this video data that you can collect. And from an enforcement perspective, you can then have, say, the targeted police enforcement during those hotspot hours. That uh, temporal hotspot there is from one of the other crossings in this study, which is a uh, New Jersey crossing. And that one has a much stronger, um, I guess, afternoon rush hour during the weekdays uh, hotspot. So that is, I think, everything I wanted to share with you folks. Thank you so much for your attention, and I hope I didn't talk too quickly. Uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. And there was me worrying <laughs> about go. time. Well done, sir. 
Uh, and by the way, many happy returns. Um, <laughs> so uh, we move on to our third speaker, um, who is uh, Dr. Surya Congress. Um, he's a senior research engineer um, at uh, what I had to look up because I did not know, as somebody not from the States, what TAMU stood for. And I'm told that it's the Texas Agriculture and Mechanical University. Uh, and for somebody who did my degree at uh, what used to be the Midland Agricultural College, I saw something of a connection. Uh, so, uh, uh, Surya is going to talk to us uh, about his uh, work in relation to drones using uh, unmanned aerial vehicles for um, uh, helping assess risk at level crossings. He has a substantial academic background, publishing research in many, many peer-reviewed publications. Uh, he's uh, given lectures and, and uh, presentations for the Transportation Research Board, uh, and indeed even keynote lectures uh, overseas, such as in, in Cairo. So uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Evan. Um, this is Surya Congress, a senior research engineer at um, Texas and m So howdy. And I know I'm in between you and lunch, so I better do a good job. So today I'll be presenting our research on evaluation of at-grade uh, railroad crossing safety using UAVs and closed-range photogrammetry technology. If you see, this is the presentation outline. Um, I'll introduce some topics related to the study, and then I'll talk about UAVs, UAS, or drones, as you know. And I'll also touch base briefly on the selection criteria needed to select drones for your appropriate applications. And then I'll go through some of the field data collection procedures that are typical. And I'll touch base on identifying up obstructions to line of sight at railroad crossings. And I'll also uh, present a case study on it. And I'll conclude with key observations. So as you can see, 50% of the total crashes at or near intersections is, you know, um, at great crossings. And even, uh, even the deputy uh, administrator did highlight about the crossing, uh, you know, accidents. You can also see 94% of all rail-related fatalities and injuries occur at railroad crossings or due to trespassing, according to FRA. So what do we need? We need to inspect it and we need to be creative and innovative. So we need to proactively monitor these crossings so that we can identify issues before they become a fatality or an accident in the future. So those technologies should be safe, quick, and cost-effective as well. So if you see UAV systems um, have been termed as most disruptive technology in human history in the last few decades. So before I ask, how many of you own a drone? See? And how many of you are FAA certified pilots or hobbyists? Great. So in the last one decade, the number of pilots and the number of drones has increased exponentially. So maybe in 2030, if I ask every one of you, probably you might raise your hand and say, I have a drone. So that's why a billion drones in the world is forecasted by the year 2030. So. With that, let me ask you, can you, can any one of you recognize this gorgeous lady with a drone? Marilyn Monroe. It was before she became famous, she used to work in the factory uh, before World War II. So, yeah. Okay. So, before we go into it, we actually are using drones with optical camera sensors. And as you know, photogrammetry is a science of making measurements from two or more images. That is, when you take multiple images, each image has line of sight to the object. So when you intersect all of them, you get a nice 3D model from 2D images. I'll briefly show uh, the 3D models also in my next few slides. But before that, you can accomplish this using your smartphones to sensor-mounted satellites can do it terrestrial or aerial photogrammetry. So in, in my study, we used uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. There are a couple of types of unmanned aerial vehicles I'll show in my next slide. But before I go on there, there is also a subsidiary of photogrammetry, which is called close-range photogrammetry, which means the sensor 
and the object are within 1,000 feet radius so that we can term it as close-range photogrammetry. So if you see, if you see uh, these are two types of um, drones. One is a rotary and another one is a fixed wing. There is also a third type that is upcoming, which is vertical takeoff and landing. So there are pros and cons of using different drones. Uh, you know, it, it depends upon your applications. So I'm not going to deal much on that. This is a typical drone. It's a $40,000 drone that we used for our study before. And you can see all of them there. Um, this is a light, lightweight frame, and these are orientation LEDs. When the drone is on the top, you can see uh, which is the uh, nose and the back. And this is a camera trigger, like we can upload a flight plan. So according to the flight plan, it triggers the camera and takes pictures. And also you see the geo box. Oops. And also you can see the geo box, which timestamps. And also the, it superimposes the locations so that we can use it for building 3D models. And this is the camera here. We have gimbals. This is the LVP antenna. So. Before we even actually go into it, I want to touch base briefly on the selection criteria for UAVs. So depending upon the payload and also inspection objectives, and also global navigation satellite system, like most drones have GPS on it, but they are as good as your phone's GPS, which is two meters off. So we use global navigation satellite system to get accurate positioning so that the models that we create are also accurate. And safety features. You need to have obstacle sensors, vision sensors, or maybe written to home. So these are some of the things that you need to consider while you select the drone. You can also see those in our publication that we discussed recently. So with that, let me go over through the field data collection procedures. For our drone data, we always need to have known points. So we collect these ground control points here using traditional GPS. But when we use GNSS, the number of points that are needed will be reduced. So it actually uh, you know, converts into time savings and cost savings as well. So once we have it, we uh, have a flight plan. As you can see, each point is where it captures the picture. And that is how the overlap is. I'll briefly show you how it works in my next slide. So basically, this is how we collect pictures. First picture, and you can also see the ground control points laid out, and this is the flight path here. So when you collect pictures, there is always overlap between pictures. One is longitudinal overlap, and other one is lateral overlap, as you can see here. So once it is uh, done with the first leg, it just moves adjacently and then collects the uh, le other leg. So there is always overlap. How do you use it? We use it with photogrammetry techniques, and we stitch them, and we model them. As you can see, the blue ones are the pictures of this parking lot that we built. So as you know, pictures are 2D, right? This is just a picture of a pier. So I just wanted to show you. This is an orthorectified picture. But what I want to highlight is these models are made of millions of points. Each one of them has x, y, z. When you have X, Y, Z, you can always measure or use machine learning tools to actually you know, uh, get the features out of it. So how are we using it now? We are actually using it for identifying obstructions to line of sight. As you can see, this is a uh, road crossing. There is a side triangle there, and there is decision point and the elevation, and also you know, uh, the vehicle height. There is always, according to different countries, we have different heights that we consider. So if there is an obstruction, how do you find it? Right now, we only find it when there is an accident. Or you know, there is no proactively monitoring these. So we came up with a, an idea where we can use, as you can see, this is a railroad crossing. Similarly, normally they use a sighting rod and a target rod at different elevations. And they see it and see if there is any line of sight obstruction at that line. But what we thought is, why not use the dense point clouds, which uh, you know, represents the existing field conditions. So what we did is, this is a ortho mosaic. Ortho mosaic means we took pictures all over and we stitched them. These are sub centimeter resolution pictures. You can go sub centimeter resolution. You can zoom in and see it. As you can see, this is a two D image, but we also get three D, three dimension, the elevation as well, right? So this is an ortho mosaic of 
these two railway lines here, and this is, this is a pilot study that we wanted to show the identification of obstructions if there are any. So the next one is a digital surface model where we also get the color which represents the elevation of that particular pixel. So you can see, if you go back, the previous one, it just shows you uh, it might be at the same elevation, but when you add the 3D dimension to it, you can actually see what the elevations are. So how do we use this information is because we have the elevation, why not draw a side triangle on the virtual model, like a digital twin or a digital model, and then as you can see here, before I move forward, you can see this is a truck that we placed just while collecting the data. So definitely, since it is within the site of, uh, line of sight triangle, so you'll definitely uh, be able to see, as you can see here, these black spots are the ones that are protruding outside of the elevation of that site triangle. And if you see the second triangle, you also see this here. And this can also be confirmed from the digital elevation model where you saw the elevations represented by different colors, right? So you can also find more details on this uh, in this paper that we published. So what it says is we can always find out, these are, these are not even uh, you know, obstructions that will cause um, too much disturbance to the line of sight, but still we are able to find even these. So we are confident that if we can apply it at uh, intersections with too many obstructions, we can find out using the three-dimensional point routes derived from the drone data. Thank you very much, Surya, um, and indeed to Asim and Beth for some very interesting uh, opportunities for how we can adopt technology. Now, I'm sure there will be people with questions uh, even if their tummies are starting to rumble. Uh, so uh, who has a question uh, that they'd like to ask? And I'm going to make sure I follow the advice from Mr. Elkins to look up as well as down. I have a question from over on the far side. Henry Posner, Iowa State Railroad. So question about drones. I've been told that you can't possibly use drones around railway installations and that there is some sort of jurisdictional dispute between the FAA and the FRA or others as to what might be done. Can, can you talk about any issues that you've had in uh, using drones around uh, railway installations? Thank you. Thanks for the question. And uh, we recently collected data in Texas. We worked with Union Pacific to collect data. So only thing is um, the, the airspace is controlled by FAA. But if you have to take off from someone else's land, you need to get that permission. But that doesn't mean that you can go and take pictures. That's a separate thing. But you need to work with the person or the entity whose property you are taking off from. So no matter if you're going to fly over another other person's property, you don't need to take any permission. That's, that's an another jurisdiction. But currently, you just need to take permission from the, uh, the railway agency to take off and land on their property. Does it answer your question? OK. Supplementary question. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So supplementary yeah. question. My idea was use drones to paint freight cars and cover up graffiti. I was told you can't possibly do that because entering into the airspace around a railway terminal would create all kinds of issues from a regulatory perspective. So I think that's about being within the, uh, the, the uh, swept path of the trains rather than uh, being at, at some sort of height. I think you talked about 1,000 feet, didn't you? So the, the, that one is you cannot fly over moving vehicles without a waiver. That's, if you get the waiver, yes, you can, you can fly over uh, trains or even vehicles. So that might be the one that you are aware of. That is, you cannot fly over moving trains as well. Uh, well this, this was directed at park trains. But let's have a sidebar conversation because I don't want to waste everybody's time. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for that, Henry. Uh, just uh, giving a, a 
perspective from back home in, in Britain, we're increasingly using drones for infrastructure inspection um, and indeed for trespasser detection. So uh, both our uh, railway police force and um, our own uh, staff are licensed pilots and uh, able to use drones increasingly. Okay, uh, next question comes oh, from... For me? Uh, thank you, yes. Hi, um, thank you so much for your presentations. I have a comment more so for Surya and a question for Asim. So let me start with Asim. Um, we talked a little bit about this with the trespasser. I saw where, I envisioned where this had an application that could also be used regarding block crossings. And this is something where it would not be tied into any kind of system with the railroads per se, since yours is camera-based AI. And um, just didn't know if you had any additional thoughts or some concepts of where, where could that go? Uh, excellent question. And uh, I, I have a direct response for this in that the AI can do it. It's a um, inherently our analysis gathers when the train arrives, when the train leaves, when the signal starts, when the signal ends. So if uh, however you want to use that data is you know, up to your folks and you know, whatever you'd like to do with it. Um, so for studying block crossings, this would be perfect. Think of it like a Swiss Army knife. You know, it does all these things that a human can do to a certain degree. But uh, if you want to twist it to something else, I'm all for it. Where the communication could go directly to the, um, the local community, the law enforcement, first responders, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Linking that up, because it, it happens in real time, that linkage could be made. So that was one of our intentions, to make this thing super useful uh, and uh, you know, as, as best as possible. OK. And so with your um, concept with using um, the drones for hump crossings here, have you had any communications with uh, Federal Motor Carrier or any of the trucking associations on that? Because there are numerous configurations on the underside of um, various commercial vehicles and specialized vehicles as well. You have the, the corn community and folks farming and things like that. Just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. That's a very good question and uh, comment as well. Uh, we currently are looking at existing literature on those configurations, but uh, that's a good, co good comment. So we'll definitely reach out uh, to the trucking associations as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> question from the back corner. Yeah, uh, first to the moderator. It took me a little bit, but I figured out the AI for agriculture. <laughs> figure that one out. Um, so I think um, one question is um, when in the AI that you use, especially for the trespasser, not in the crossing, the immediately thought that came to my mind is that um, is another issue, which is suicide prevention. And um, a lot of the mapping software, you know, navigational mapping software, they use the, the cell phone data to realize, to tell you or to tell anyone how busy that particular street is and what velocity, you know, and the, and the density value. Can, is there a possibility of using the data when you demark a zone and then using, because most people now will have some kind of device with them and use that data to, to actually detect because from reports that I read, people that are, have that intention of, you know, they loiter for, for a substantial amount of time, or somebody that is taking a picture for, uh, for a prom or, you know, graduation that also takes quite a bit. And what's the possibility of that? Excellent question. And I'm going to use my, like, I guess, creative mind here to think of how this could work together. So I've heard of people who uh, can have, um, or, or heard of uh, pilot projects where you would get an alert in your phone if you enter a property based on uh, you know, cell tower and stuff like that. But that so the data exists at a, what I would call a low resolution by comparison. And that could inform where you would want to actually place a camera to get that high resolution data of people loitering and lingering there. Is the same person coming back and you know, standing there? And why are they actually doing that? Are they just taking photos? Or are they you know, maybe have different intentions? So I think that one could lead to the other, where you get this, like, you do this wide study that says, look here, and then we bring the camera out there to actually look there to see where the, uh, look how, and start tackling those, I guess, maybe suicide prevention or the, that kind of thing. That's how I would see it happening, but the possibility is definite. Or maybe you can use drones. <laughs> yeah, that's our <what> drones. <laughs> yeah, true. Slightly off target, but uh, same principle of using that AI technology to detect people doing things you're not expecting, uh, as we've heard in relation to uh, perhaps suicide prevention, we're also trialling it for use in stations to detect people who enter stations with malicious intent. Mm -hmm. So the likes of uh, marauding uh, bladed weapon attacks 
uh, and the AI being able to detect that and alert control center staff rather than them having to scan uh, cameras all the time. I have a question in the center. Uh, yes, um, this is uh, Frank Frey from the FRA out of DC in the Gray Crossing uh, safety uh, area. And this is actually for Ms. Uh, Venat. Um, you had a slide deck that showed uh, your FRA's uh, uh, st st uh, statistical data going up to um, 2019. Mm -hmm. And we do have uh, data now that's current uh, up through 2021. So right. um, just want to at least l let you be aware that we're, um, we're current Excellent. up to that. And I was, it'd be interesting to see if you added those additional two years, what the um, end results would be uh, yeah. on that. So. No, that's great to know. Um, and we've been using the FRA database for other, we do research in like short storage crossing comparison, so we've been using it a lot of different ways, so it's been really fantastic. As someone that come, came out of aviation and sort of the a a ASRS database I'd used for years, so that's great to know. Thank you. Thank you for that point. Um, are, are there any questions from the balcony? I'm, I'm trying to block out the bright <laughs> lights. Uh, that's not the people, that's the bright lights. The lady at the front here, if you'd like Very to just well. raise your voice, because I'm not going to ask them to run upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> Geofencing was the term I was looking for. I couldn't think of it. Yeah. Yep. So we did trial in the UK using uh, geolocation data, so geofencing, to transmit warnings into um, typical social media platforms mm. um, uh, during a, a campaign. So as people approached a crossing, uh, that they they if they were using one of those social media platforms and in our target um, demographic then they got a warning flashing up that they were coming up towards a crossing. Uh, we used it just in a campaign. We've not developed it further, but we have explored it. So thank you very much for those examples. Um, I think we have time for one last question. You're all satisfied or you're all hungry. <laughs> so before we leave, I'd like you to please put your hands together to thank those three excellent presenters. Good job. Good job. Good job. Yeah. Good job. Thank you, Alan. Now, there's some interesting administrative deals that we have to discuss. Uh, one other new safety issue. If you're going to be using the balcony, which we have a nice full balcony today, very pleased, please be aware there is a cable up there providing power to that very bright light. That is a trip hazard. That bright light is also extremely hot, so please try to sit a couple of seats away from it. So uh, initially, we weren't going to use the balcony, but we we're very blessed to have uh, overflow capacity today. All right. Now, the most important part for this hour is lunch. I'm going to hold you hostage. I have informed the staff not to allow you to have lunch until we all step out onto the front to get the official ILCAD photograph. Now, that was Isabel's idea. It's all her fault. And she's going, what? So what I would like you to do, if you would please, uh, we'll orderly file out to the front. We'll get a group photograph put together. We're going to put it in a way of a wonderful background that we've already got for the whole center. Uh, I have some people stationed outside that will help direct you. We'll get that shot. And then the food is hot and ready now. So thank you. See you out front.